Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is a meeting of the Prostate Cancer Lab, or Cancer Patient Lab, where we're going to be focusing on Raina McKay's uh, recent insights, and particularly the case of Brian, but I'll let him introduce that. I'll, I'm responsible for the housekeeping. We've got two standard disclaimers. One, this is for information purposes only. This is not medical advice. We're trying to give patients and caregivers information they can take to their medical team. Second, um, I call this the Miranda rights. Everything you say can and will be used against you. Uh, this is, uh, everything will be made public. We will publish the recording, transcript, and meeting notes. Um, so if you're concerned about your anonymity, hide your, hide your um, video, change your name, and don't say anything. Um, and finally, uh, we are a patient-led uh, volunteer community, and we would appreciate any donations you can make, which you can do through our website. With that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Awesome. Thank you, Brad. Just pull up my presentation here, our presentation. And there we go. Okay. Can everybody see uh, what I'm sharing my slides? Okay. I yes. See some head nods. Um, so, so we're gonna um, maybe pivot here just a little bit. I know that this session was sort of set up as you know, Dr. McKay was going to talk about novel therapeutics, um, but over the course of the past, oh, I don't know, four or five days, um, there's been a change in my uh, in my case, which really kind of warranted um, bringing together. Um, Dr. McKay and um, Boston Jean with uh, Kirill Kriyakov um, to really talk about the linkage between multiomics and uh, clinical decision making. And so that's really what we're going to talk about. So um, I'm going to kind of set us up, uh, just to give a, a brief introduction, talk a little bit about my cancer journey. Um, Kirill will discuss the multiomic insights, which I think will be like, fascinating for, for many people. They are in-depth, I think some of the most comprehensive multiomic, multiomic insights that I've seen. And then um, Raina will talk about uh, the clinical implications. So, um, you know, just a, a quick word before we kind of um, get into my cancer journey, I've wanted to um, say a few words about Boston Gene and about, um, about Dr. McKay. So first off, um, Boston Jean has been absolutely incredible um, in their uh, outreach to me and uh, pulling together what you're going to see is just absolutely unbelievable information uh, in terms of tracking and defining my cancer, um, uh, uh, tracking it over time and defining it. And, and that's just uh, been really amazing. And I know that they invested a lot of time, resources and money in making it work. And I'm uh, uh, incredibly grateful. And then finally, um, uh, Dr. McKay is, of course, a brilliant medical oncologist. Um, but just a brief story about her because it's pretty pretty recent. Um, just about a week and a half ago on Mother's Day, uh, I was writhing in pain in my in my bed, and um, my wife <laughs> sent an email to Dr. McKay and said, um, uh, "Brian is having a lot of problems." Um, we knew that it was related to a compression fracture that I had on my L2 vertebra um, that was the result of an infiltration of my cancer in my L2. Um, so on Mother's Day, uh, Raina said, hey, you know, you got to call an ambulance. And so, of course, we did that. And um, for the next four days, Dr. McKay completely quarterbacked my care across the emergency department, the uh, urology team, the radiation oncology team, um, her team, um, and uh, orthopedic surgery. And so I'm just so thankful to have her as my pilot or co-pilot in this pilot, in this, in this endeavor. She's been my doctor ever since I was diagnosed uh, in 2016. I think she came on board in 2017. Um, but I'm just so thankful that um, that she's there for me and for my family, for that matter. And she's just a courageous and amazing 
doctor and just a, a amazing person. And so I'm just so thankful. So thank you, Dr. I, McKay, for being Ryan, here. You are fantastic. You're going to like you. make me cry. Like I, uh, whatever it is that you need, buddy, whatever it is your family needs. And um, I'm here for you. Um, I know it was a very, very, very rocky weekend. Um, and I'm so glad Kristen sent me the email that she did. Yeah, we got I mean, you in the right class. <laughs> it was incredible. And it was we won't take everybody through that uh that that harrowing story, but um yeah, you know, um I've got you know, I've got some recovery I've got to do. Um but you know, medicine is not just about um the bits and the bites which we're going to focus on today from a, you know, scientific perspective with multiomics. It's that care. Um and Raina is just uh just just next level. So anyway, so, so thank you for being here, um, Kiro. I thank you so much for all of your work and I'm looking forward to digging into this. So um, I don't wanna take up too much time. This is a kind of a busy slide. I'll, I'll just talk about the, the high level components of it. Um, this is really sort of my cancer journey. Um, and on the left-hand side, there are two anchors. One, as you see, there's a primary sample of my prostate and the, in the bottom left, you'll see there's a secondary sample or, which, which represents the pelvic mass. These are sort of the bookends um, of tissue that uh, that Boston Gene has used to track the evolution of my cancer over time. And what you see on the right is a very detailed view of when I was diagnosed in 2016 in all of the various therapies that I've had um, some of them are systemic therapies, you know, obviously androgen deprivation, ADT, radiotherapy. Um, there's a you know, second line hormone therapy with apalutamide. Um, then moving on to, you know, docetexel plus, uh, plus uh, Keytruda or Pembro. Um, I'm not going to take you through all of them, but I've had, oh, I think the, at least seven or eight different systemic therapies. And, you know, um, and we've just been basically batting my cancer down as as we've gone through this journey which is really kind of coming up now on eight years um and in th this really is sort of like um uh the, the footprint for um how we've looked at my cancer and how boston gene has specifically looked at my cancer and thinking about each of the different selective pressures meaning those systemic therapies and how they change my cancer over time and sort of where it stands um, as of the end of this analysis, which was well, the, sa the sample tumor uh, where the pelvic mass was in November of 2022. So we'll call it 2023. Um, so the, the, that date is kind of getting a little bit old, but we're gonna use it um, as we go into uh, the next steps. So uh, Carol's gonna talk a little bit about the multi element analysis and then uh, Raina will talk a little bit about the clinical implications, which um, I'm really happy to share with everybody. So Carol, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, first I want to uh, a little bit uh, with words uh, for Brian also, because it's a great pleasure to uh, work with uh, such an interested uh, person, such an interested patient with uh, so detailed history that uh, you present to us and uh, also wish to have uh, all patients like Brian. Uh, so uh, about uh, whole analysis that we performed in our uh, in Boston Gene, uh, here a uh, little scheme uh, uh, with uh, blocks. Uh, oh, uh, does someone have a uh, little problems with, uh, with my... Uh, Listen, listening to me. Yeah, you're you're very hard to hear. Very hard to hear. Okay, uh, let me try to fix it. Uh, okay, and uh, what's now? Is it better or the same? Um, maybe a, a tad better. Uh, I'm hearing the same. Some people are hearing the same. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Give me just a second. I try to fix it. Oh. Is it some way better now? I suppose um, no. it's it's about the same. About the same, okay. I think it was quite a better for me, Kira. Uh, maybe maybe I can try to just uh, speak uh, louder uh, and and slowly. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. That's, that's a that's a bit better. Thank you. I'm gonna put myself on mute. See if that helps too. Uh, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, it's uh, uh, unusual problem. Uh, so, as I said, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, different, uh, two different samples for analysis, for analysis uh, primary tumor sample and uh, metastatic sample. And for both of them, uh, we performed uh, several types of analysis uh, with uh, multiplex immunofluorescence, our uh, new uh, genome uh, sequencing, and uh, IHC tests. And uh, from uh, collected blood, we performed immune profile and report. And uh, then all together this analysis, uh, we create uh, some integrated presentation with uh, most valuable findings. So uh, you can move to the next slide, Brian. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we will some alteration uh, that uh, were observed uh, exclusively in the second sample, and among them, uh, amplification of androgen receptor and uh, co-amplification of uh, KIT uh, PGGFR and VGFR2, and along with uh, 10 gene mutation. And uh, this alteration suggests uh, an evolutionary divergence uh, within the tumor, highlighting their heterogeneity and uh, potential targets that may emerge as the disease progress. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, and uh, here a uh, visual uh, confirmation of this, that uh, no of uh, these findings were revealed in primary tumor, and uh, all of them uh, were found in uh, metastatic sample. Uh, next one, please. Uh, then our transcriptomic analysis focused on some uh, biomarkers uh, that are valuable uh, as uh, antibody drug conjugates for therapy. Uh, specifically, we looked at uh, drug 2, nicotine 4, and uh, SLFN11. And all of these uh, markers uh, in um, both samples demonstrate medium or high level of RNA expression uh, based on the, our uh, pan cancer uh, cohort that includes uh, most types of uh, different types of cancers. Uh, and next one, please. And also, we uh, revealed uh, medium or high level of expression of uh, some uh, other potential biomarkers like HER2, HER3, and uh, TGF beta. Uh, okay. uh, also, our transcriptomic analysis uh, allows us to uh, create uh, portraits, uh, functional portraits of uh, microenvironment. And uh, we uh, reveal that it's changed from immune desert in uh, primary prostate sample to fibrotic in uh, metastatic sample in uh, pelvic mass. And this also can uh, demonstrate that uh, not only tumor evolves, but uh, immune microenvironment changed too. And uh, also we performed uh, 
complex uh, multiplex and fluorescence analysis based of uh, a lot of uh, markers of immune system and of tumor cells. And uh, on these slides, you can see overview of uh, these two samples uh, stained with uh, major uh, markers and uh, changing in uh, composition of uh, these two samples. And next, please. Here we uh, revealed uh, several interesting findings. Uh, firstly, uh, we uh, noticed that uh, a lot of uh, tumor cells uh, demonstrate expression of synaptophysin in the static sample uh, near the 38%, and only 3% of uh, tumor cells demonstrate this expression in primary sample. Uh, we also confirmed it by expression, uh, by RNA expression on uh, of uh, synaptophysin and uh, promogranin. Uh, from primary sample to uh, metastatic. And uh, also we, uh, then we uh, review uh, gematoxylin errors in images and reveal that um, in the metastatic sample, we also can find uh, areas with uh, narrow endocrine-like features uh, for the histology. Uh, then we performed analysis uh, based on MXIF uh, on the uh, immune system of uh, these samples. And uh, also we can see some uh, valuable findings. Uh, firstly, it's changing in uh, balance of uh, macrophages. In primary sample, we've seen uh, approximately um, a similar amount of uh, M1-like uh, type macrophages and uh, M2-like type. And uh, in the second one, in the metastatic, uh, almost all macrophages demonstrate expression of uh, CD163, uh, uh, like markers of uh, this. Mm. And uh, also we can see that uh, number of uh, CD8 positive T cells uh, decreased from primary to metastatic sample. Let's move further. And uh, our next uh, step is the immunoprofiling report uh, that uh, based on the uh, number of immune cells uh, from uh, collected from the blood and uh, based on uh, different levels of expression, we create uh, blood portrait types that uh, characterized uh, patient's immune system. And uh, for Ryan, it's uh, G4. Uh, chronic uh, blood portrait type with a high prevalence of uh, natural killed cells, uh, memory effector cells, and uh, T cells of uh, CD4 plus eight, CD8 plus. Uh, so, based on uh, all these findings, uh, we uh, propose uh, our uh, treatment option and uh, also uh, present this uh, data to Brian and uh, his. Uh, medical team, and we are very interested in um, collecting feedback from uh, you and uh, listen to a possible treatment decision based on our analysis. Thank you. Sorry, gang, I was muted. All right, well, thank you so much for uh... For going through that. I think there's a lot of really exciting pearls to, to pull from the report and pull from the information. You know, I, I when I think about, um, you know, how do we strategize selection of therapies for any given patient in the clinic and utilizing these precision medicine reports for guiding therapy selection, I think we need to really think long and hard about, well, what clinical data do we actually do have available on whatever it is target or um, attempts at therapeutically, um, you know, uh, uh, targeting the target um, uh, in prostate cancer thus far. We need to also think about, well, what are the agents? What are their side effects? What's their compatibility with other agents access? So there's a lot of pragmatic things to think about when we take this report that has, you know, what do you want to say, 20 or 30 hits, and how do you actually dis integrate that into something that we actually will end up giving a patient? 
Um, Cause I think there's a lot of really interesting things, but at the end of the day, do you feel comfortable enough injecting said therapy in the patient or, or having somebody take that oral medication? So, um, and I think also availability of these agents really matters. So I think the salient things that I pull from this report is um, really the striking angiogenesis signature. There's multiple different um, uh, VEGF pathway uh, genes that are dysregulated. And I think what's important to pull, you know, is that there's there's multiple different targets here as opposed to just one that could all be targeted with a drug. So when I see that, that's a very nice thing as a clinician to say, hey, this is not just one thing out of a sea of many. There's multiple targets in this pathway. This pathway seems to be off um, and that may present a greater vulnerability for the tumor. And additionally, VEGF inhibition in prostate cancer has a long, long history of drug testing. Um, and there's actually recent data that were presented from um, the Cosmic 021 study um, from the phase one of cabozantinib atezolizumab. There's a large phase two of contact two. Um, I think sometimes the design of these studies, um, you know, it, it's not exactly the situation that, that Brian is in or the eligibility criteria aren't exactly the the position, the, the situation that Brian is in, but um, we can take really uh, important data um, about uh, what we learn from the clinical testing of these agents. Um, there's also several studies, you know, what's what the other, so the salient thing is the angiogenesis signature, the kit, PDGFR, VEGFR, um, which would uh, suggest uh, targeting with uh, a VEGF TKI. Um, the focal um, synaptophysin expression, in addition with the SLEFN11, um, is a, a potential, potential marker for um, platinum sensitivity. At least the data on SLEFN11 um, has suggested that. And so one of the other things that we had been toying with is do we do like, you know, cabazitaxel carboplatinum and go down that? dual chemo route, or do we do a chemo sparing strategy? And um, there is data for the combination of Lymvat and, uh, uh, of VEGF inhibition with IO and actually neuroendocrine tumors. There's actually a clinical trial currently ongoing with the combination of Lymvat and pembrolizumab um, for neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine differentiated tumors. And actually the trial that we're thinking about for Brian allows, um, is actually being amended to allow neuroendocrine tumors to enroll um, because of the fact that we've seen some signals and other data sets of the activity of VEGF inhibition and immunotherapy and neuroendocrine tumors. And so, um, you know, I think the trope 2, the Nectin-4, um, the HER2 expression are exciting really just around the fact that there's ADCs out there. Um, but I think we need to kind of keep in mind that this is RNA data. This is not necessarily protein data. Um, I wish we could do like multiplex IHC to actually look and see if it matters here. Um, you know, trope for, for all the current ADCs that are being used, they are not... Um, uh, they're not necessarily uh, biomarker selected per se, but I think this does open up the door um, around, uh, you know, um, thinking about antibody drug conjugates. I think they're a little bit farther behind in um, prostate cancer than some of the other stuff that kind of came up from the sequencing report. So we were really, again, toying between Cabazzi Carbo versus Nevo Cabo. And at the end of the day, kind of settled on Nevo Cabo, just given the fact that we can likely get these agents and try to get them on trial. Um, there's a lot of safety data already on these agents. There's a lot of safety data on the combination of these agents. There is a track record for efficacy in prostate cancer and um, are kind of working on trying to procure these two drugs for Brian um, you know, on a trial. And if we, if we can't get on the trial, kind of uh, going through uh, patient assistance programs through these drug companies. But questions, I see uh, 
Syed has his hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, how do you connect? I think this is the uh, expensive and extensive analysis, omics data analysis. And I believe you had some early question you tried to answer. One of them is your the uh, your final uh, finding the uh, suggested what they call it therapy, right? How did you came up with this idea based on those analysis to reach to that final decision about the therapy and using two drugs? Um, it's based off of the. I mean, this is this is what I do. <laughs> so that's uh, it's based off of knowing the data, knowing the data in the field, knowing well what are the drugs that target VEGF. These are the drugs that target VEGF. Um, what are the studies of those drugs in prostate cancer thus far? Okay, we have a signal. This is how they're being used. Um, you know, uh, Brian's tumor doesn't have a strong, um, you know, immune signature. Um, but what we've seen is that the VEGF inhibitors at least tend to work better in combination. And we've seen with IO therapy, and we've also seen data in lung cancer of that uh, like small cell uh, cancer of the lung, neuroendocrine differentiated tumors, that they tend to respond better to IO therapy, or at least they're more responsive to IO therapy. So this is sort of where we came up with the concoction of an IO combined with a VEGF based off of, you know, what we saw in the report. Uh, so is it the single cell data analysis, single cell, or it no. must be this is This is a commercial test that any doctor can order. I'll let... Um, I'll let uh, Michael and the Boston Gene team um, speak to this. This is this is just a you know uh, a next generation sequencing company, next next generation sequencing company. They yeah. just the reports are getting better and better. What you know what is um, the information that's displayed is better. Yeah, Everybody sorry, does this. Yeah, my question is: is, is it the bulk uh, analysis transcriptomics? Or yeah, this the is bulk, single this cell. Is, this is bulk RNA seq. Thank this you, is not sir. single cell analysis. Yeah, this is this is bulk RNA seq from FFPE tissue. Thank you, Brad. You wanna you wanna call on yourself, or you want me to? I'm, I, yeah, <laughs> I can I can moderate as well. I got to. Um, so if you have questions, just use the raise hand uh, feature uh, in Zoom. Uh, so um, looks like uh, Brad's up, and then we've got Jonathan. Yeah, Rena, I just wanted you to explain this at like a level up because I don't speak um, maybe at the drug level, but I do speak immunotherapy, chemotherapy, and targeted therapy. So if I just play this back, Brian has a number of mutations that were identified of which VEGF looks the most interesting. There's HER2, or there are other things, but you sort of focused on VEGF. And then you chose a... Uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, Optiva or nivolumab, right, which is sort of immunotherapy, which is <clears throat> immunotherapy is always a problematic in, in uh, cold tumors, quotes, uh, for immune checkpoint inhibitors. So why is it going to work? And then why combine it with uh, the, and I don't even know the, the this other drug, the target, I guess it's a Tyrone K TKI, which means it targets the pathway that VEGF is on, I guess. Anyway, so if you could just sort of abstract it up a little um, to sort of talk about the strategy or the thought process, I guess it's, it's similar to Saeed's question, but um, if you could just kind of do a eighth grade level version of, of this, of the, the, the treatment strategy. Yeah, so I think it's it's based off of the targeted sequencing report but also based off of the data in the field thus far. So the combination of cabozantinib is being tested with immunotherapy in the field. And the regimen of nevocabo is actually already FDA approved to treat another type of tumor where there was demonstrated efficacy in other kinds of cancers. And so the combination of immunotherapy and cabozantinib is also being tested in prostate cancer. And the old school data of Cabo monotherapy was not as great. You know, there's no comparative of looking at the Cabo combined with the Atizo. So I think it's understanding the field 
that has also driven us around the decision for immunotherapy and also understanding the, okay, there, there could be some underlying, you know, neuroendocrine features of this with the synaptophysin expression. Um, and, you know, neuroendocrine, like atezolizumab, for example, which is the same drug that was tested with Cabo, is FDA approved for neuroendocrine lung cancer. So I think in addition to just like, you could be a purist and just treat off of the report and be very myopic and just treat based off of the report. That's not my strategy. My strategy, just as you integrate the data from the report, all the data that's available publicly in the domain of everything we do is also needs to be integrated. And so I take what's in the report and integrate it with the data that's in the field to come up with the best strategy. And just a, just a final question, and it, and it sounds like this could be changing every six months. Like the answer today, because of those trials that are going on and the results of those trials, six months from now, you might come up with a different answer. Yeah, and it also depends on what's important for Brian and where he's at right now and what what the, has the patient gone through? What prior treatments has he had? What do we want to save for later and not use now? And what do we like? So it, it may be this, you may generate the same exact report in a totally different patient with a totally different history and a totally different, and you, we will come up with a different thing to do. And the report may be exactly identical, but we will choose something else because of the clinical context in which we are seeing things. Maybe this individual hasn't received XYZ therapy, or maybe they have, you know? So I think you can't interpret the reports in a silo. You've got to put them in context with your patient. What are the goals for your patient? What are, you know, how are you going to strategize subsequent line therapies? What's your patient gone through? What is, what's going on in the field? What's happening in the world of prostate cancer? What's happening in the world of solid tumor malignancies that I can apply to Brian's case? And, and just like just... Brian had K. Truda, so he's had it, an immune, immune checkpoint inhibitor before, and he felt it didn't do a good job. He didn't fail the immune checkpoint inhibitor. We stopped the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Actually, mm -hmm. that was sort of an exclusionary on this trial. You can't have failed a prior checkpoint inhibitor and go on this trial. But he didn't fail the checkpoint inhibitor. We ultimately decided to stop it, and then after he stopped it, at, at a subsequent time point, ultimately ended up progressing. And I was just going to chime in here. So, you know, it's um, it's like kind of like this part art, part science component. Um, and just understanding, you know, where the patient is in the journey is just so critical. You know, and Rain and I, you know, went back and forth really between these two options of Cabo plus Nevo at, at versus uh, Cabazitaxel and Carboplatin. Um, and I was personally just very hesitant to go down the cabazitaxel carbo route because I was afraid of what it was going to do to my um, my bone marrow and my uh, my uh, immune system. And um, I'm also, you know, very data driven. And I saw that that Cabo plus Nevo could target this angiogenesis signature in the VEGF. And um, I was, I, I really wanted to kind of like go in that direction and save this other therapy um, for a later time. And we also know that there are therapies, you know, let's say that I, I start the Cabo plus Nevo, there are other therapies that could even um, come after Cabo plus Nevo, um, such as actinium or, um, or, or maybe we, we go after uh, HER2, whatever, whatever the case may be, we can save that for a later time. You know, as a patient, we're trying to stay as healthy as possible while we're undergoing, you know, these, these treatments, which are obviously, you know, can be so, so detrimental in and of themselves. And so anyway, so I was just saying, you know, Rain is really, really good at, at, at understanding all of those dynamics in, in the, in the, the sense of what my clinical history is um, and as me as a person. And so that, that relationship is just absolutely key. So um, I want to have that color. Uh, Jonathan, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um... Thanks for this presentation. It's pretty amazing having the patient and uh, the diagnostician, the 
you know, all of you together here and presenting is really remarkable. Um, so, however, I sort of missed a step. Uh, Brian sort of filled it in a little bit just now, but the, you know, you showed like four different uh, genomic, you know, oddities and sort of things that treated them uh, if somehow have some relationship to treating them. Uh, and then in the end, it was uh, sort of an existing clinical trial that you went with. So you chose that because the, it sounds like you chose these because of some connection with VEGF. Is that right? And if so, could you could explain that a little more? So um, the genes that were altered um, or upregulated in Brian's tumor are all part of this angiogenic pathway, this like blood vessel growth pathway. Right. And so VEGF is one of them, PDGFR. Um, so those that pathway can be targeted with inhibitors to VEGF. And many of the VEGF inhibitors also have activity at other kinase domains, such as the PDGFR. So that's basically what we did. So um, cabazotinib uh, and uh, nivolumab, those, one of those or both of those uh, um, inhibit blood vessel growth? Correct, correct. The cabozantinib does. Cabozantinib. And then you're throwing the... Ni the uh, ne the ne Nevo. This is called Nevo. C Cabo Nevo. Okay. <laughs> Nevo. The Nevo's in there just to throw in another uh, um, immunotherapy. Is that right? Yeah, and sort of the data in the field about the two being synergistic together. I see. Okay. So... Um, but the other uh, Cabo, well, the other uh, angiogenesis inhibitors, are you considered, did you consider throwing those in too? No, um, I think it's going to be too toxic to do two different kinds of VEGF inhibitors. And Cabozantinib has a track record of activity in prostate cancer. Um, it also targets another protein called MET, which is also predominant in bone disease and bone metastases, particularly in prostate cancer. So, you know, it's just sort of knowing that data. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Uh, and this is for both you, Dr. McKay and Brian. What are, what are you hoping to get? You know, what are you expecting? What kind of response are you expecting and hoping for? I mean, realistically hoping for. So Brian, I, I don't mind chiming in and certainly for you to chime in. You know, we're, yeah. we are, I think the goal of therapy is to ensure that we can delay the time to progression and ensure that Brian has enhanced quality of life while he's on treatment and can continue doing the things that he wants to do. Those are our two goals. We don't want him to progress. We want him to live longer. And we want him to do what he loves to do. Great. So the goal of therapy, it's not the goal of, you didn't hear me say the goal of therapy is to drop PSA. You didn't hear me say the goal of therapy is to make things shrink on a scan. You didn't hear me say that the goal of therapy is to decrease the SUV uptake on his PET scan. Those are not the goals of therapy. The goals of therapy are delaying the time for progression, whether it be clinical progression or radiographic progression, like overtly progressing and making sure that Brian has a great quality of life. Yeah, so There's a lot of stuff that happens in there that can detract us away from our goal of preventing progression that can like, my PSA is going up, but your scans look good and you feel good. Keep going. Right. You know, I'll just add. I'll just add a little bit of color. I I couldn't say it any better than what you just did. But um, yeah, you, know, you know, um, my PSA has sort of like been on the march. One of the things we didn't really talk about, you know, is that my my original Gleason score was a nine. 
So we know that I have aggressive cancer. And, you know, I, I think that um, often we get concerned about PSA rises. And I think um, when I came off of docetaxel just in February of this year, I think I was at like 2.5. And I think it's now like up to 40 or 70 or whatever. And, you know, to be honest with you, like I'm not worried about that. I, I really am not. Um, I'm, I'm more concerned about getting a therapy that is going to, um, stop slow the, uh, the progression of my disease and do it in an intelligent way. I mean, you guys know that I'm like super data driven and you just saw an amazing presentation from Boston Gene, which is like just replete with data and I want to leverage that knowledge to the extent I can to pick drugs and drug combinations that are going to preserve my quality of life and just keep this thing at bay while, you know, while medicine continues to advance. Yeah. And, you know, just over the course of the past eight years, there have been new drugs that have been coming along. And there's a, a lot of talk right now about activity. And we just had a you know, a patient only discussion on Monday where we spent a lot of time talking about, uh, about actinium. And so anyway, you know, whatever the drug is, I mean, these are bridges to get us there. Yeah. Um, and and it's a, it's a real issue trying to stay healthy, um, while undergoing these therapies, as I think, you know, we all know, and you know, the longer you go, the harder it is, you just get farther out on the branch. So just finding that right, that right, you know, finding the right drug that that preserves that that balance of quality of life, keeps this thing at bay. That's a that's a touchdown for me. I, yeah. I think too. I think we need to just be like, we are trying to, like Brian was said, do this in an intelligent way. Be smart about targeting. This is the whole like we're trying to understand a vulnerability in the tumor that can be leveraged with therapeutics. And that's what precision medicine can do is it can help try to identify a specific vulnerability that we can take advantage of with drugs that we otherwise would not be able to. And the the comment about PSA, PSA is a very, uh, it's a tough marker to follow in the CRPC setting. Brian has AR amplification. He's going to have a high PSA. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have more PSA producing cells the cells you have just make more PSA. You have AR amplification. The cells you have will make more PSA. So it PSA can be a very tricky thing to follow so and track us. in CRPC. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it's not as important as in the as in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. In the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, it's very reliable, but in the castration resistant setting, it's not as reliable. And especially in somebody who's got AR amplification, where you know, where you start seeing like rapid rises in PSA, like when I have patients and their PSA starts going haywire, I could almost guarantee you they just picked up an AR amplification when they just start going like off the charts with their PSA. So for following this going forward, will you just watch how Brian is feeling? Is that going to be the measure of success? Oh no, we do a ton of testing. We do we we're data people. We do we we watch well, how he's feeling, of course, but we we check his labs, we check we check PSA. It's one of many things we look at, but we don't make unilateral decisions around PSA. Okay, but if Brian let's say some of that stuff goes bad, but Brian's feeling fine, are you gonna intervene or change or if Brian's feeling great, but he's having radiographic progression, I would have to ask myself and ask Brian, okay, how many spots can they be radiated? Can we introduce another modality to treat the areas of progression that we see? If there's more progression um, than can actually be targeted with radiotherapy, then we're going to have a discussion and say, hey, I know you feel good on this therapy, which is a very good thing, but you know, you've got some more lymph nodes that are growing and the lymph nodes are enlarging and what what do we want to do about it? We may say, you know what, we're going to, you know, 
there's a lot of different paths that we can go. You know, we can decide to switch gears based off of that. Generally, we do when there's overt radiographic progression that we can't target with some other means. I and mean, when my goal is to keep his disease burden as low as possible on his scans. Like I don't want, you know, I want to keep his disease burden low. And one last question. I've used a lot of time. Thank you. Um, uh, what, uh, how often are you going to test or how often are you going to radiate uh, uh, image? It depends. Usually it's about three months. Um, we may do sooner if needed, if need be based off of symptoms. We may do later if he's feeling fantastic and his PSA did decline and he's feeling so good and Maybe he was going on a trip and doesn't want to get scans before he goes because that's just always a bad idea, <laughs> you know. We may, but we we decide on those things together. I don't make those decisions unilaterally. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah, that was a good. That was a really good discussion. Uh, committee, good to see you. Good to see everyone here. Um, committee, first of all, I just wanted to. Thank uh, Dr. McKay, Brian, of course, and uh, Boston Jean. And this is just all all three angles coming together, watching that happen here. You know, just how it happened is very powerful. Um, I had a question uh, mainly for Dr. McKay. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, theranostics like Lutathera? Have, I mean, in this case, are they is that even approach even applicable? Or, yeah, just generally your opinion mm. on that route? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's uh, theranostics. I think there's a lot of really exciting things that are coming down the pike. Um, you know, Lutetium PSMA is already FDA approved, um, but this is sort of the balancing act with any given therapy. Um, Brian has um, an obstruction in his kidney um, and uh, that we've been dealing with. We don't want to put in a percutaneous drain to drain urine out. Um, he's got a stent in place and there's only so much we can do to help alleviate that obstruction. So actually having severe hydronephrosis or severe swelling of the kidney and um, not being able to clear that obstruction is a contraindication for Pluvicto uh, because then this tracer is secreted in the urine. And if you're not, if you're obstructed, you're just going to, you're just going to have like radioactivity in your kidney just sitting there causing damage to all of your organs. So, um, you know, there's some radio tracers that are not cleared via the urine. Um, like radium, for example, is not. Uh, we could do radium, but it's only bone targeting. So I think these are things that we, these are very practical things <laughs> that we have to contend with um, when we're thinking about therapeutics. Um, so there's other, um, you know, there's other uh, uh, agents coming down the pike. Actually, we, we're going to be having an actinium PSMA agent through Converge um, here at UCSD. Um, hopefully that'll get activated in the next three to six months and will be available um, in the uh, castration resistant setting. So there's a lot of really cool radio ligands mm -hmm. that are being developed. So is that, if I understand correctly, that could be sort of like the next arrow in the quiver or the next, after this, you have that waiting in line to sort of perhaps, I mean, if, it, if it's it could be. At it. it could be. I think we'd have to make a decision around a nephrostomy tube if we wanted to go down that route. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, committee. Uh, Rick, I thought you were leaving. You were just like um, you yeah. know, I went what over. I I have to tell you guys, I went over to my FMI meeting. I told them where why I was late, and they said, "Well, why don't you go back? We want to hear this meeting too." And we, <laughs> the, we reset the meeting for two hours later in the day. So I'm thrilled to be back. And Doctor R, God bless you. I mean, amazing. What you what you're doing for Brian, we 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 love it. Um, I have a couple of um questions for you on treatment options, and interested to know um what your thoughts are. Um, the first is you mentioned um you mentioned neuroendocrine, so there's enough in this report that gives you some concern that maybe there's a a, a neuroendocrine element uh, creeping in. I I wasn't smart enough to pick up all those, but I heard neuroendocrine, and that's when my ears go up because we've lost some people very dear to me because we didn't catch the neuroendocrine early enough. And I think it's fantastic that 
for Brian, we have caught it early, so we can respond to that. Um, I was on the neuroendocrine side, I was wondering whether there's any um, evidence in this of DLL3 protein for, for, for Dr. Misher and, and Rahul's trial. And the other thing I was also wondering, because you were talking about the ampli amplification, and we've seen a couple of guys really respond well to the um, to the protein degrader, ARV766, because they had amplification, but they also look like they've got any NEC disease. Um, just saw one guy, um, they haven't done the scans yet. Um, and I hate to say this after what you said, because I agree with you, but it did drop his PSA by 50% in three weeks. So um, what about those those sort of two avenues, the DLL3 and the ARV? And what else can you do really early for for if you see the NEC disease? Got it. So very good question. So I think, one, we don't know how to actually adequately define neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Right, right now, right now, I think probably the definition is based off of histologic assessment. Mm -hmm. And based off of histologic assessment, Brian does not have neuroendocrine prostate cancer. He does not have histologic neuroendocrine prostate cancer. He doesn't have, and I think we actually may have even done this on your prior, um, one of your prior biopsies or tissue sampling. I can't remember which one. He doesn't have IHC positivity for synaptophysin or chromogranin, though there's a lot of controversy in the field whether those should or shouldn't be used in defining neuroendocrine prostate cancer. What we saw, the this little signal, what we saw was that there's increased RNA expression of synaptophysin, very focal increased RNA expression. So we're just congesturing around, hmm, what does that mean? What is that? We see that in people who have histologically identified neuroendocrine, which Brian does not have. He has histologically has an adenocarcinoma um, and he's got an AR amplified <laughs> adenocarcinoma. So, um, but, so we don't really, you know, that's the one potential thought around neuroendocrine here. So he doesn't have bona fide neuroendocrine. Like, so um, uh, DLL3, I didn't actually see it in the report. Um, I think it'd be nice to include it in the report. Um, that was, you know, Rick earlier who was talking about steep. I don't think steep's in the report either. So it'd be good to think about all of the markers in prostate cancer. And honestly, for tumors in general, just to make sure that there's reporting on that. So I don't know what the DLL3 RNA expression is. Again, RNA is very different than protein. And then I think the last question that you had was around the degraders. So we yeah. actually do have ARV766 open here at our institution, but right now they're only enrolling for uh, AR mutated tumors, not amplified, mutated. You have to have an AR mutation, which Brian does not have. I think it would be great to try to get on a degrader study. There's a couple of different agents that are out there. Um, and uh, and I think our Venus is going to be opening up this study and expanding the cohorts. So there could potentially be an opportunity in the future to get on that agent. Um, but I know that 766 development has been now acquired by Novartis. So that's going to probably right. delay things. So we'll see the field does continue to evolve. Right. Does, does Brian have the... It sounds like you're saying Brian doesn't have the right mutation, the right AR mutations for yeah. the ARV766. Right. Right yeah. now, the study is enrolling okay. patients with ligand yeah. domain mutations, like, yeah. like you know, 702. Yeah. Got it. Mutations. Yeah. 787, I think, was one. I don't remember. Okay. Yes. yes. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, we only have two minutes left, um, unless. Um, you can go over. Um, Rainey, can you go over or do you have a hard stop? Um, I do have a meeting at 10, but we can go one to two minutes over. Well, uh, okay. Um, Alan, you have your hand raised. Um, it, it, or is that a mistake? No, that's not a mistake. Hi, Dr. McKay. Uh, thank you so much. We'll, we'll, we only have two minutes, so. Okay, I'm going to try. I'll try to make it fast. I'm going to put you in the context of what I will call the end of the line patients somebody that has presumably exhausted all standard of care uh, measures. 
And I am a pathologist, and I'll let you know I'm starting to get the Foundation One reports, the Keras reports, the Tepes reports. I, I do not get Boston Gene reports, uh, I, but th never mind. So I'm getting these reports, and they're identifying something like a vascular signal. Um, I uh, um, these reports are starting to get so good that they link uh, those things to uh, what may be um, uh, clinical trials or maybe even trials or accepted therapy in other uh, cancer settings. Um, it sounds to me like um, what you're trying to do with Brian is to do, in a sense, standard of care, you're, or you're trying to do the fence between standard of care and right at the frontier. Um, it seems to me when you use the phrase such as data, what you're trying to say is, hey, I want to stay somewhat within the limits or guardrails of standard of care, what's out there, what's safe, et cetera. Um, I, 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 my question is, do you ever stray to phase two signals or do you ever stray to, to um, other things that maybe some people colloquially will say, call um, um, uh, off-label stuff? Uh, uh, like, for example, you stated that Brian has very strong vascular signals, uh, but you already answered that you wouldn't dare go with a double vascular uh, inhibitor that might be complementary and might be particularly effective, I suspect, because you're going to say there's no data. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is this group, this patient empowerment group, is trying to reach in part, is part, in part, is trying to reach for end of line patients and what's right there at the frontier, what might be phase two stuff. Um, uh, do you stray, I mean, do you stray outside of uh, phase or, I guess what I'm getting at is UCSD actually has this thing called a precision oncology pro protocol. Do you really have something special at UCSD or do you just have the foundation reports that are by um, software linking up to what clinical studies are and trying to get patients into clinical studies? Uh, end of complex question, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that is a question that I don't think we can answer in two minutes. Um, yeah. That's a very kind of uh, multi-embedded question. And it's not to say the level of, it's, it's not level of phase three or phase two or phase one. Half the stuff we're talking about is all phase one or may not even be in testing. So um, the issue about dual VEGF inhibition is it has been tried. It's incredibly toxic. Okay. And it doesn't work very well, even in tumors where they're addicted to VEGF. Um, so, you know, I think uh, you just have to be very careful. I would never give that to Brian because I think I would hurt him. So, um, yeah, and I think at UCSD, we, we do have a very robust uh, precision oncology program. Um, we have uh, an infrastructure with a molecular tumor board, both for, for precision immuno-oncology and precision targeted therapy that meets very regularly to review and align around treatments and actually have a team that helps us procure drugs too, because that's half the battle. Thank you. Raina, thank you, thank uh, you, Alan, for your question. Um, I'm going to close this up here. If, if folks want to stay on and when I have like a little uh, after discussion, we can do that. We'll stop the recording. But thank I just